Uh, My Mets Bible is the name of the book. Scoring 30 years of baseball fandom. And Evan Roberts wrote it, and he's with us. Evan, congratulations. You got a real hardcover book right here. That's I still be cool can't thing. believe it. And it comes out today. My Mets Bible. Thank you very much for having me. And even though Boomer had no interest. You know, I'd, uh, I have already promoted the book. I understand. And, but and I never got to thank you for promoting oh the book God. before anybody else did. Uh, thank I you, saw Boomer. it. I said, let, let me bring it in here. Let, let's talk about it. And and basically, it's your Bible, and it's I guess got like a number of your score sheets in there or something, <laughs> some kind of crap or something. You know whose idea this was? Uh, you know whose idea this was? And it pains me to admit whose idea this was. Craig Carton. Yes, that son of a bitch. It was his idea. <laughs> why? Why? What? <laughs> Can I defend myself from being ugly? I mean, basically, I smell, I'm disgusting. Giannotti's saying I'm like a red carpet. Am I really that ugly? You know, all right. The, 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 you're when not... you grew that thing out, were you uglier, if uh, I'm being honest? Uh, Remember yeah. that thing at the back of your head? Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of a, uh, a bald head uh, situation that I got going on here. But I feel like my appearance is a lot more adult-like than... <laughs> Than what you portray. Oh, more I'll agree a, that I'm a child. More, more of a more yeah. of a professional. I listen. I was defending you most of the time. I do think though that you sitting next to Tiki <laughs> with this beard and hair thing is making it look. No one ever commented on your appearance as much as they are now. I agree. And there's two reasons why. One, yes. you're growing out the hair, and two, you're sitting next to Tiki. I completely agree. He's an Adonis. I mean, Craig was a disheveled mess. Yes. And Beningo's Beningo. So right. to sit next to Tiki makes it a lot worse. But, you know, quite frankly, I look at this beard every morning and I'm starting to say, you know, I kind of actually look pretty good. Yeah, I would. It's too bad you can't treat You're rolling your eyes at me. Am I that ugly? <laughs> no, just, just keep telling yourself that. That's all. Because <laughs> I'm not going to agree. But and do that's I all right. smell? I'm sitting right next to you. Do I smell? No, you do not smell. Thank no. You. You've actually done a lot better job of, of your personal hygiene. It just looks bad on TV. That's all. I think that's what the callers were saying. That's not what we were saying. <laughs> but you weren't exactly defending me. Well, why would you're I like, ah, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> is he still taking his bird bath? <laughs> but yeah, that's what I wanted to know is whether or not you're still doing that. Nah, she was right. I don't bike anymore. Oh, I got okay. run over by a taxi. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Al Dukes yeah. called me from the hospital. Can you come on the air to give us an update on your health? Yes. I'm like, no. I'm laying in a hospital bath. But, but it is true. You were doing bird baths yes. in the bathroom. I yes. was. So I was. It wasn't like I was making something up. No, I did do that for a while, and now I drive in like a normal human. All right. Uh, okay. okay, so I, I do want to actually talk about the book and help you promote the book, but now we got on all this stuff. So what the, the Sal stuff yesterday and him going after you, now apparently he apologized afterwards. But Well, I went in and told him, and by the way, this may not change your opinion on opening day. That's up to you. I didn't take off. I came back. I was here by 4.30, and we recapped opening day. It was called day. a half a day. It was a, absolutely. It was called half a day. It was a half a day. So when I informed Sal, he apologized and then got pissed off at everyone for not telling him that I had come back at 4.30. Did you go with your dad? I did go with my dad, yes. Okay. Yeah. Did, do I know you? You do know me. Did I, I stuck up for you. I said this is something he probably does with his dad. Do and... you remember the time that you traded shifts with me to See go this? to opening day? See that? Do you remember that? No, I don't. You don't remember that? I don't remember. <laughs> that so Craig got sick and I got the phone call of Craig's not feeling well can you fill in okay and I sat in with you for an hour and a half you were miserable I mean you were not happy doing it with me and I understand that <laughs> yeah you can <for> sure <laughs> yeah and then I did the midday show and Craig <laughs> said to me Evan and at that point he never said five words to me yeah what can I do to make up for the fact that you had to work a double and you filled in for me and I looked at him and said on opening day me and Joel do the morning show you do the midday show and he said yes. And you guys did the midday show. Oh, we day. did the midday show. And I was able to you get guys. To yes, I do remember that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we stayed on. Yes, I do remember that. Too. Thank so, you for that. Yeah, so we were good guys. We we're good teammates. Unlike Sal is calling you out and screaming at everybody and calling us. Yeah, that felt a little, I mean, out. to be honest, that, that felt a little real. <clears throat> I know we go back and forth and bust yes. each other's balls all the time. That felt more it, real it than did. some of these other oh, things. Oh, I think he was genuinely pissed off at me. I think he was pissed off at BT for taking days off. I, I understand. I mean, I got it. He was a little annoyed. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, uh, I, so I said I was surprised that you weren't hosting because I, I felt like it was different when your name is like the first name and it's the afternoon drive. It just felt you different. You're the guy. You're supposed to be the guy. Well, what I was planning on doing was being on the phone with Tiki to set the scene from opening day <laughs> okay. and then leave early, which I did, and get back on the air in time to recap the game, which is what I did. And usually you're pretty good with the vacations. I worked with you. You would you would time out like when you take vacation. I still do. Only during right. the summer and Christmas. Right? right. See, so it's not, it's not like you have a habit of missing big times in sports. I mean, I 
I agreed with Sal in the sense that you should have been working that full day. But in your defense, you've been on the air here for 30 years at this point, and you you plan out your vacations when the time is right. Yes, I'm a sick freak. And opening day yeah, is like well, a national holiday. Yeah, and I know that's how you treat it. I, I knew that more so than anybody else what around a waste here. That, that's, that's, why, <laughs> that's why when Gio brought it up that morning as we were getting ready to leave, I was yeah. shocked because he was talking about how Usler went to 50 opening day uh, games, and he posted that on X, and I said, we got to give him a, a, a ribbon or something right. for that. Or, I mean, how many opening days have you been in two consecutive? Ones? Well, there's a, there's a controversy involved in that, because in 2021, I did not go to the Mets home opener. I didn't take off. I did the show with Craig that day, but I went to the season opener in Philadelphia. So does that count, or not really? I, it's opening day. I think it's I mean, you tell day. me. I don't know. That's yeah, not really the Mets opener. So then I don't have a streak. He doesn't have a you streak. You don't have a streak, but I, I can understand. But th- th- it, but because of that conversation, yeah. this is where it all started because Gio questioned whether or not it was right for you to go to opening day right, as opposed right. to working. So it just started here. So you're taking credit for me calling Spike a dildo head? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's what, what he's Gio saying. Is. <laughs> I'm not, I, you keep bringing up what you started. I don't care that I started it. it well, you that. did start it. Yeah, but you That's like your take on this whole thing is like you brought it up first. I'm not looking for I was credit. covering you back because I, you you I knew you were going with your dad, and I knew that this is something that you and your dad have been doing for years and years and years. My and dad years. has been there like 50 straight opening days. His so he's like Bob Usler then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's on that same level, yeah. All right, Evan Roberts is with us. He's taken a ton of abuse the last couple of days, uh, but we are here to uh, promote this book that comes out today. All right, so yeah. uh, my, my first media interview. Thank you for that. Do you have like a bunch lined up? Or? Got, going on with Dog, actually, I think. Like, oh, really? Two. Yes. Oh, that will be good. That will be a good one. Uh, my Mets Bible scoring 30 years of, of baseball fandom. Now, you actually wrote this? Because I remember yes. when Joe Beningo, when he wrote that book, when I was working with you guys, it came out and there was like 17 different errors in there because some guy wrote it. <laughs> yes. Nothing about sports. You that remember that whole yes. thing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're like, well, what do you mean? It was so funny. Like, the Mets did not score in 1959. <laughs> you're right. What the hell is this? He was so pissed off. But you actually wrote this thing? Oh, yeah. It was cathartic. I picked the 81 most memorable games. There's a lot of losses. There's a lot of wins that most people know. And then there's random games that just mean a lot mm-hmm. to me my favorite game i picked is the one you were involved in when you joe and i went to la and it's not the drug story it's the <laughs> dirty mike francesa story yeah in which i was at the height of my sickness because i am a sick person i admit that with sports i'm, I'm sick yep. childlike i've heard you describe yes. that g it's, it's very accurate i'm a childlike you know weirdo when it comes to baseball and in 2009 they lost this horrible game in la when ryan church missed third base i would not speak oh. I was a mute that night. I would not talk. I, it was, I don't know it was much... pissing me off, actually. I'm, I'm sure out, was. I'm out there in L.A. You know, Joe and I are like, listen, the loss sucked, but whatever. We're, let's have a good time. You're right. It's beautiful weather. <laughs> and Evan's just being like this total, like, like petulant kid about the loss. I'm like, dude, let's go, man. Let's have a good time. Let's have some drinks or something. Let's go. And I, was, I was a mess. And I so wouldn't act that way anymore. And G got me out of it by doing a porn-like, dirty Mike Francesa imitation. Yeah. And that got me out of my muteness and my quietness. <laughs> and you were laughing and able to And have I a put that in okay. the book because that was one of my more memorable ones. So where does the book start? What, it, how, do you, how do you start it off? I found the first game I ever scored, which was a game in 1992 against the Pirates. Barry wow. Bonds hit a game-winning home run. I don't remember the game at all, but it, when I went back into the archives to find, like, okay, what's the first game I ever scored? That was the game I found. So that's the one I don't remember. The rest of it are either every big game the Mets have played in the last 30 years or games specific in my life. Mm. Like the time I made my girlfriend and family watch a 20-inning Met game and not go out to dinner on a Saturday night. That was another rock-bottom moment. That's when I realized (laughs) I have to grow up. See, I did have that moment that I had that was similar to yours. It was the 2004 NFL season. And it was like week 17 or maybe week 16. And the Vikings and the Packers played on Christmas Eve. And the winner of that game would win the division. And the Vikings lost. And it was Christmas Eve. And my parents, I was with my parents. And and I said, I'm not going to the Christmas Eve party. I'm going to sit here in the dark. And then after that, I was like, what, what am I doing? I mean, I was, I was, that was 20 something. That was 22, maybe. That's the difference. Like, G and I are actually very similar, except he grew up. That's the, that's the, right. You stayed, you stayed stuck. So, how many yeah. games have you scored in your lifetime? Thousands, believe it or not. So, I do you go- have all the books. I have all the freaking books. Yes. I have them all saved. That's why this was a cathartic experience. I picked 81. I wrote about what I remember from that day. And then I have the ones that I didn't score. There's only two games that are significant in Met history in the last 30 years that I have reasons for not scoring. The 9-11 Piazza game, 
I was on the train back from D.C., rushing as fast as I could after those horrible attacks. And so I wasn't at that game that night. And then the Wilmer Flores crying game. Oh, yeah. I went home that night after Joe and I did a show, and I was just in no mood to sit there and score a baseball game. (laughs) Now, it is pretty cool when you look back because Evan and I are just about the same age, um, a little bit, like a year older than him. But seeing some of these names and these, like, going through this and Bernard Gilkey and David (laughs) Segui and Brett Saberhagen and Jeremy Burnitz and seeing this stuff and Evan's like, little kid writing is is, is pretty cool. I got it as, as dweebish as it is. <laughs> okay. If you are of the same age as Evan and I, and you look back on this stuff, it jogs the memories. Hey, if it's you, it's you, man. That's all there is to it. Well, that's why when you say I got to dress better, that ain't me. I know it's The only you. thing I altered, and G was there for this too, is when we went to Yankee Stadium early on in the midday show. I think you were there for this. And I wore sweatpants. Oh, yeah. I remember. And Sweeney yeah. was like, what yeah. are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, it's cold. I'm trying to keep myself warm. I learned from that mistake. Now I go back to Yankee Stadium. I dress up very, very nicely. <laughs> but in general, when I come to work, what do you want me to do? You want me to dress like somebody I'm not? You want me to act like somebody I'm not? Who does that remind you of, Al? Sweatpants. Sweatpants. Craig? Yes. You wore sweatpants. <laughs> opening pants, day. Sweatpants, whatever. Shorts, it's opening flip-flops. day. Oh, oh man. Fringe, we had very similar shorts. we had similarities, man. Yes, you yes, you did. A lot of similarities. <laughs> yeah, see, I was just saying, I don't know if you heard that part of it. I go back and forth where I'm like, all right, I got like Evan's forty years old. He's a first name on the afternoon drive show. He's a father. Like, he should clean it up. But then at the same time, I'm like, that's who he is. Like, I don't, you know, if he well, that's is, if thing. that's who I, he is, it's who he is. I can't change who I am. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a child. I admit, that's the one thing Spike said that I would agree with. I do love my children. Uh-huh. That was BS, and I'm glad he apologized. But as far as. <laughs> yeah, but you called him a dildo head. Well, his head kind of looks like, a, I mean, am I wrong? I mean, I, I, you can't call somebody that, especially Why? your boss. <laughs> Why? You didn't take it that serious when I said you look like Joe Biden. You laughed it off. You were a good guy. <laughs> but I'm not your boss. You got a good sense of humor. Yeah, but I'm not your boss. <laughs> I think the first time Boomer saw Spike, he goes, oh, hey, why the long face? <laughs> Did that horse joke? See, you agree with me? <laughs> no, I thought he looked like a meth addict. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, there was what that was. too. I didn't say about the long face. Uh, all right, but so, I was just trying to welcome him to WFAN. Now uh, we have listeners who who love baseball. Now, when you were writing this book or you had the idea, did you think like maybe this is like too crazy for the baseball fan? Like yes. to the point that like it's not going to appeal <laughs> yes. to everybody? Yeah, that's why I'm like, I better come up with Boomer and Gio on every show I can. Uh. So you have a little bit of anxiety about how it's going to work out and stuff? I mean, I guess I would too. You know what's funny, bro? I, I didn't write this book to make money. I didn't write this book to be famous. I wrote mm. this book because it was cathartic and it was actually a really good idea and I appreciate that Craig had that idea and I ran with it. It was a cathartic experience to take all these scorecards that really, what use do they have right now? Like, my oldest son is interested in scoring, but he's not interested in looking back at my old book. So what are they doing? So to put it to good use, it was a cathartic experience. It was fun reading about the history of this team. And by reading, I mean going through these scorecards because you could see everything that happened in that game. It comes back in a flash when you see a scorecard. So I hope it does well. But honestly, this was just a selfish passion project. The worst game, the one that that brought you back, because there's there are still moments, even though I, I my level of passion has changed in a way in my 40s. But there's still games I have a tough time talking about or thinking about when it comes to the Vikings and the Mets. Um, what were yours when you were going back in this game? One of the 15 World Series game, one of the 2000 World Series, because they were the freaking exact same thing. Yeah. Game seven of 06, which is obvious. And then, you know, game six in 99. Because they had come back, yeah. they had made it 3-2, they took a lead in that freaking game, right. and then Franco blows it, Benitez blows it, Kenny Rogers walks in Andrew Jones, <laughs> they were all equally painful. But you know what's funny? I think 2015 was worse, and I'm not sure if you feel this way. You've seen no championships in your life, G. Right. And I understand that your fandom to the Vikings and the Mets, it's there, but maybe it's not the same as it was 20 years ago, which is healthy. But isn't there a part of you that when they get close and lose, it's a reminder, I'm going to drop dead and never see them win? Oh, yeah, of course. So these more recent losses, like 2015 may be the worst. I mean, what about the Matt Harmon game? game, You know what the problem is? It's up there. We were dead down after three. game one. Yeah, you're down three. Uh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. game one was a freaking killer. They were in the ninth inning, and Familia was outs away from going up 1-0. And for it to end basically the same way it did against the Yankees, that one's worse. I, I, I don't too. You know. That Matt Harvey game, man, that was, you know, he was cruising was right game. along, and then everybody's screaming about keeping him I was him one in. of them, yeah. I was there, man, too. Terry Collins went against his best. Like, he had intuition that he, he had to pull him out. I think I thought I should have taken him out. And my wife screwed up that game. I took her to that World Series game. My wife and my dad. 
and we were going to Kansas City the next night. We were going to go see Mets Royals game six and seven. And my wife looks at me as the ninth inning starts. She knows it. She knows it. Where she's sitting at home right now. She knows what she did. Okay. She looks at me and says, "Honey, we're going to Kansas City. This is going to be fun." And I said, "Excuse me." <laughs> Yeah. I said, are you freaking kidding me? You talk about touch the money, Boomer. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, maybe she doesn't understand touching the money. Now some she does. Yeah, now she does, but some people don't understand that. You know, the worst game that I could, you know, 06, uh, game seven, obviously, is way up there. And game five, when the Yankees were celebrating on Shea Stadium's turf, the World Series in 2000, that was bad, too, when I was there. But honestly, the the one that that I think was the most impactful to me was – Game 162 in 2008. Yeah. As they blow another lead in the division, they can't hit again. Yep. And they're closing Shea Stadium. Because at that point, like when the doors closed there at Shea Stadium, that was sort of my Met fandom was never the same after that. Because mm. I also, I moved to Pittsburgh the next year. Right, right. So I had to focus on that stuff. I came back, things had changed. Like that, and I, I remember, I will admit, I walked out of there with tears in my eyes. And to see Tom Seaver and Mike Piazza come out of center after field, the game. Yep. you know, after the game to do that ceremony. Uh, I mean, they probably should have done the ceremony before what, the game. Yeah, but, what, but it was just like, I can't believe yeah. that they blew it again. I and know. There was, remember who the hitting coach was that year? In 2008. Yeah. Who was the hitting coach? It was Howard Johnson. Oh, really? Okay. And I remember Howard Johnson had to leave to, like, go back and change for the ceremony. Right, to be on the the walk around the bases like they did. Right. And I just remember him walking past where I was sitting, shaking his head like, I can't believe it. We didn't hit again. And It was just so goddamn depressing. But it was supposed to be great memories of, of Shea Stadium. It just ended up being a funeral. It was the worst possible ending, and it's up there, man. I think the problem is, like, I want to sell this book, but it's very depressing. (laughs) (laughs) I will say, though, that 2007 season, the the year that Craig and I started here, I think. That was was the first collapse. That was the 7 and 17. Yes. And that was the Tom Glavin at the end of the year. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was an unmitigated disaster because I remember Craig and I had just started that September. And we were all getting jacked up because we got this great pitching staff and everything else. And then all of a sudden they came down and they just kept losing and losing and losing and, lo- and losing to the Marlins. I know. I, it was brutal. Any of those games in there? Or They're no? all, every game you guys just talked about okay. is literally in this uh, book. So why, you know, There's no big game missing from this book. And that game 162 in 2008, it was my dad, it was my sister, and it was Steve Summers. Oh, I took wow. Steve to the last game. All right, so here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. <laughs> he was what, in a, quite a move. What, what positive games are in there? What there has to be positive, <laughs> some positive games in there. I don't know if this resonates with you, G. The Johan no-hitter was Oh, come on. Ama- Excuse me? What? <laughs> what threw a issue? thousand pitches, blew his arm out, and done. Oh, stop Just it. Just so we could all have oh, a no-hitter. stop it. I, lo- I love the no-hitter. Thank I will you. admit, I loved it. Of all the people, you're an old man, so you've seen it all. You probably remember the Jimmy Qualls game, right? You remember that. Little young boomer seeing Tom Seaver thinking he's pitching a perfect game. The no-hitter was the one thing we couldn't get. And we got it on that Friday night. And you're throwing it back? And we blew out his arm. He, dude, he was going to get hurt anyway. Oh, okay. Stop acting like that was going to be the uh, the end of him. I just I just thought, like, the thing to me is that the no-hitter means nothing. Winning the game yeah. means everything. It did mean and, a lot to Mets fans. It meant that a lot. Well. I was in the building. that The other one, it's recent, was DeGrom in game five in 2015. I thought awesome. that yeah, was pound was awesome. for pound. Yes. One of the greatest games I've ever seen. All right, good. So there are some good ones in there. I did the math on the 81 games to see what their record is. They are above 500. So That's they're good. Are That's good. You know, the funny thing is, he talks about the Johan Santana no hitter and like as this positive moment, and I think of it as a negative moment. Yeah, yeah. no, just I, because I felt like what? What, how many pitches did he throw? One hundred thirty-five. Yeah. yeah, and that was it. Well, I thought you were old school. Like, what? oh, they should have taken him out. Is that what you're? Is that what you're saying? I mean, no? I, I, they should have taken him out. How many pitches? Just will you calm down? <laughs> well, just answer the damn question. Did he pull from the game? Yeah, yes, I do. Because you're going to come on the radio in two weeks, bitching when Aaron Boone takes someone out with a no hitter. No, I'm not. Yes, okay. I'm not. I mean, they took Benai out last night. He gave up a hit. Oh, he did give up a hit. That's right. But how about that? The, the Houston pitcher. How many uh, pitches did he have last he night? He actually threw under 100. Yeah. 105. Yeah, okay. That's actually. what I'm saying. Oh, he got over 100? Yes. He was yeah. like 90 starting that night. That's thing. what I'm saying. Like that, That's what you want. You don't want 135 or 140 pitches to accomplish oh, something geez. that doesn't When did really you become matter? such a saber metric geek boomer? Wow. Oh, yeah. Look at the pitch count. Oh, he threw too many pitches. What kind of what happened? Why'd you? you just calm down? <laughs> because you say things that <laughs> annoy me. It's like you start the show saying they should trade Pete Alonso. 
Take like uh, purposely tried to piss me off. No, I, did I, I, I did, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Did I start I just, the show with to, that? To be fair, yes, we did talk about it, but we said there's a scenario in which they have to do it. That's they all. Have right. to do it. I'm going to give you a couple of things. I don't want this to end with, with our show hating you as well. <laughs> <Sorry>. um, <laughs> so two things underrated wins uh, for me that I hope are in the book: the Bobby Jones one hitter, 2000 NLDS in the book, and the Benny Agbayani 13th inning home run in the book. All right, good. I don't well, think I missed any like big big game from this book. Like, those every are big un- game is underrated that. wins for me in Mets history. If those you had, two. if you had to write the Yankee book, how much bigger would it be? <laughs> Dude, I could write a Yankee book of just Met Yankee games. Yeah, I'm sure you could. Because there's 14 Met Yankee games in this book. 14 of them. Wow. And I could have put more in there. There's a lot of torturous Yankee Met moments. How about that trip we took down to Philadelphia to see the Yankees and the Orioles after we saw the Mets <laughs> and the Phillies? Is that is that trip in here? <laughs> you know, so I wrote 90 games, so I had nine that I kept out. Like, so I, I figured, let me write about more games, and then I'll cut a few out. I wrote it, didn't make the cut. Okay. Yeah, because... That's when A-Rod blew me off. That's right. Uh, that's a Rod blew you off. And and I convinced a drunk Evan Roberts to get the last hotel room for us to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a suite that had like six rooms and a hot tub. And he just, I got him. I convinced him to hand his credit card over. I, I was did like, do listen, it. you're the host, man. You got to take care of it. Yeah, I, you got to take care of it. I did do it. You remember what you were trying to do that night? I do, yes. What yeah. were you trying to do that night? We were trying to find women because we were single. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In any way, shape, or form. We were doing our best. We had the credit card out, ready to go. Yeah. It <laughs> Obviously, it didn't work. It uh, did not. No, Bob, it did not. By the way, uh, the, Louis, snoring 10 the Louis Castillo out. game is in there, right? The Louis Castillo game it's is in the book. has got to be in there, yes. yes. That's going to be. Oh. All right. So, uh, I mean, obviously, you get books anywhere these days, right? You yeah, you go to Amazon, your local bookstore. I'm actually doing book signings, which is comical to say. Staten Island, April 10th, Barnes & Nobles. Good. And Good for you. That's April, what you're supposed to do. April yeah. 12th in Astoria, Queens, back the old stomping Nice. Days. You got to pound the pavement, man. Let's go. And you know what I did very brilliantly? Just to make sure people show up. Got Tiki coming with me. Oh, that's smart. <laughs> that's smart. Very yeah. good. Yeah. That's how you use your partner. My Mets Bible scoring 30 years of baseball fandom. Our guy, W. I love how it says WFAN's Evan Roberts here. I'm there glad that go. that got Damn on right. there. Thank you, guys. I All appreciate right. it. All Absolutely. Right, man. Good we'll see you soon, man. All right. Boomer and Geo on the fan and CBS Sports Network. 